Hello and a very warm welcome to this special edition of World Panorama. In the next 30 minutes, we'll look back at the year 2013 with me. Let's get started with the power struggle in the Pacific region, an issue that became huge towards the end of the year with both China and the US locking horns over territorial space. Among Washington's regional allies, Japan was the most vocal in welcoming the US assurance that it was upping its game in Asia. It saw in the statements the signs of efforts to cap the ever-increasing Chinese influence in the region. But the year is ending on a note of ambivalence for Tokyo that seems to be feeling somewhat led down by the Obama administration's pivot. The dispute over the islands has stunningly become symbolic of present-day world politics. The islands have only a modest strategic significance to whoever ends up claiming them. But the real question for all the stakeholders is who will become Asia-Pacific's hegemon? 2014 is most definitely set to see the US-China relationship reshaping the landscape of Asia-Pacific. Here's why. Vowing to usher in a new model of relations between the US and China, President Barack Obama and Xi Jinping sat down together in June, their first meeting since she assumed presidency. More recently, US Senator Marks Barkas who has taken a tough stance against some of China's trade practices, was nominated by President Barack Obama to be the next ambassador to Beijing. This key development comes in the context of substantial change in 2013, with a once-in-a-generational transition of leadership in China and the US pivot of foreign policy towards Asia. And in this fluid, unpredictable environment, there have been tensions between Beijing and Washington. For instance, China's decision to announce a new air defense identification zone and the near collision of US and Chinese ships in the South China Sea are only the latest moves in East Asia to bring the reality of a new strategic competition and regional arms race out into the open. By making the announcement of its new Addis, China is seen to be making a three-sided gamble. First, that the US will not deviate from its stated position of neutrality on the island issue. Second, to test the limits of the United States' support for its most important regional ally, Japan. And thirdly, Beijing intends to test the United States' commitment to its new Asia pivot foreign policy strategy, in which the US gives greater importance to developments in this part of the world. Conceptual arms races aside, a very real arms race is developing in East Asia, with each country bringing forth new strategies and weapons. Japan unveiled its first ever national security strategy in December, a momentous inflection point in Japan's history that shows the country's concern about its security environment and competition with China. South Korea has taken additional steps to push back against Beijing. The country's navy conducted a sea and air military drill in an area within the Addis and also expanded their own Addis more than 300 kilometers to the south. If China decides to put in place another Addis in the South China Sea, the countries of Southeast Asia will be sucked further into the dispute. All this makes it seem as if the Pacific is on the precipice of something terrible. With so many other crises ongoing around the world, the dispute needs to be dealt with before another unnecessary military and diplomatic crisis breaks out. India and its neighbours in South Asia are integrally bound by the ties of ethnicity, language, culture, kingship and common historical experience. India exists as the hub for South Asia. 2013 saw India failing to build strong relationships with its smaller neighbours, not just Nepal but Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bangladesh and Myanmar. Bhutan is an exception as India's friendship with this landlocked Himalayan kingdom has not only improved over the years, but India has outmaneuvered China's repeated attempts to launch formal diplomatic ties with this strategic South Asian nation. The other exception is Pakistan, where reducing tension itself is considered a big diplomatic victory. A look. More than six decades after independence from the British Raj, ties between India and Pakistan continue to be marred by mutual distrust. Recent hostilities along the common border suggest this won't change anytime soon. In the 
the past year alone, India has reported 57 violations of ceasefire by Pakistan, which have amounted to the death of eight soldiers and one civilian, while Pakistan has also accused Indian forces of crossing the border and mounting charges that have killed nine soldiers and eight civilians. Newly elected Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has been emphasizing peace with India as the only way forward for Pakistan, a country threatened significantly in matters of internal security. While bilateral issues that create conflict and contestation between India and Pakistan need to be resolved by the two themselves, in the larger international arena, India can be seen stepping up its campaign. The forthcoming elections in both neighbours, Bangladesh and India, raise uncertainty over the settlement of the land boundary, trade route and hydraulic issues between the two neighbours. In Bangladesh, the main opposition is to boycott a parliamentary election on the 5th of January. More than 100 people have died in political violence in the run-up to the vote. The latest deaths came after the execution on 12 December of Abdul Qadir Mullah, a leader of Jamaat-e Islami, an Islamist party. Mullah was convicted by a popular but deeply flawed tribunal of war crimes during the bloody secession from Pakistan in 1971. Sheikh Hasina's unpopular government has lost control of large parts of the country. The main opposition, Bangladesh Nationalist Party, led by Sheikh Hasina's nemesis Khalid Azia, conducts its politics in the streets. It has been calling one general strike after the other, crippling the transport system and the economy. Its ally Jamaat is fighting for its sheer survival. The relationship between India and China experienced both highs and lows in 2013, with high-level reciprocal visits and inking of a pact to defuse recurring border standoffs after incursions by Chinese troops dented bilateral ties. Notwithstanding tensions, Prime Ministers of both the countries paid back-to-back -back visits to each other for the first time in nearly six decades. Chinese Premier Li Kaohsiung visited New Delhi in April and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh travelled to Beijing in October. The emerging economic power of both India and China has made many of the developed countries reassess their geopolitical strategies in Asia. The South China Sea is a flashpoint of regional interest. China rejected an offer for settlement of competing claims through international arbitration. The 10 ASEAN nations are in the process of entering into trade relations with China that wants to deal with issues bilaterally. The relations with neighbour to its south, Sri Lanka too, created ripples through the year. Indian Prime Minister confirmed that he would not be travelling to Sri Lanka for the 2013 Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, sending External Affairs Minister Salman Khrushchev instead. A decision that was read by the international community as putting narrow domestic interests ahead of a realistic pursuit of India's national interest, demonstrating a clear lack of interest in connectivity with neighbours. The diplomatic and commercial relations between India and Maldives have hit an all-time low since the row over the GMR-built airport erupted after a coup deposed former President Nasheed and brought Wahid Hassan to power. The taking over of the airport by the government led India to put a number of sanctions on its old allies by tightening the issue of free visa to Maldives citizens. The recent elections in Nepal have helped instill optimism in Nepalese that there will be sustainable peace, progress and political stability in their country, a positive sign for India. Let in December, senior trade officials from India and Nepal met to discuss issues like increasing Indian investments in this country, improving transit facilities and controlling unauthorised trade. Conceding a long-standing Nepali demand, India has allowed the landlocked Himalayan nation to import bulk cargo from third countries through two more customs points as against the present single point only. Among the global hotspot events that took place through 2013 left West Asia poised on the brink of new developments with potentially far-reaching consequences. In Afghanistan, the Karzai administration is keeping the U.S. in suspense about the fate of its intended troop pullout. The delay is triggering fears that the U.S. could withdraw from the country, leaving it without the resources to secure itself. The Assad administration in Syria, on the other hand, bought time for itself against the relentless advance of the rebel armies by agreeing to destroy its chemical arsenal. Iran also indicated a new start by promising to stop its quest for nuclear weapons. Year 2013 started for the world on an increasing note of concern over Afghanistan. It was to be the year when the US would start the countdown to wrapping up Operation Enduring Freedom, its 13-year-old war against terror in the country. For India, 
The anxiety was whether Afghanistan could become a secure country given its limitations in tackling the Taliban and policing its borders with Pakistan. Amid growing fears that Afghanistan was all set to become the backyard for a new phase in Islamic terror, the Hamid Karzai administration said it was starting efforts to have talks with both the Taliban and Pakistan. Over the year, reports said the Afghan government released over 600 Afghan and Pakistani Taliban prisoners. A number of these high-profile Taliban leaders were close aides of the Taliban fugitive leader Mullah Omar. Pakistan also released dozens of high-profile Afghan Taliban prisoners to help the peace process. However, the Taliban still spurned the Karzai-led administration, a puppet government of the US. In June, US-Afghan relations reached a flashpoint when the Afghan army took command of all military and security operations from the NATO forces. President Karzai suspended security talks with the US after Washington announced it planned to deal directly with the Taliban. In October, US Secretary of State John Kerry announced that a partial agreement has been reached. But key questions still remain on sovereignty. One of them was who would have the jurisdiction for crimes committed by US forces in Afghanistan after 2014. In November, the Loe Jirga backed Karzai's security agreement to provide US military bases in Afghanistan after the NATO troops formally withdrew in 2014. But in a sudden development, Karzai ignored the recommendation and said he will not sign the bilateral security agreement till next year's presidential election to choose his successor. Syria started 2013 as one of the biggest global trouble spots. Fierce fighting and gunshots ushered in the new year with the rebel forces fighting the Assad regime pushing on into Damascus. The forces took control of Yarmouk and Palestine refugee camps pushing out pro-government fighters. After weeks of heavy fighting, they swept into western rural Hama and the northern town of Haram. They recorded their biggest victory on January 11. The strategic Taftanaz airbase also fell into their control. The situation reversed in September when UN weapons inspector said chemical weapons were used in an attack in the Gauta area of Damascus in August. 300 people were killed but the UN didn't explicitly charge anyone for the attack. Amidst growing pressure both from the rebels and the international community, in October President Assad allowed international inspectors to start destroying Syria's chemical weapons. The agreement came after Russia stridently argued on its behalf, prevailing upon the US to put off its plan for carrying out an air strike on Syria. Towards the middle of 2013, the world reacted with alarm to these visuals. With reports claiming that its nuclear reactor was almost ready, Iran claimed that it had started operations at two uranium mines and a uranium ore processing plant. The reports suggested that it was all set to produce its own fissile nuclear material. Barely a month later, the country went to elections. Reformist PAC cleric Hassan Rouhani won the presidential election, gaining just over 50% of the vote. President Rouhani told US broadcaster NBC that Iran will never build nuclear weapons. Later, in an address to the UN General Assembly, Rouhani repeated the offer of time-bound and results-oriented talks on the nuclear question. In November, the P5 plus 1 group of US, Britain, Russia, China, France and Germany met in Geneva. Iran agreed to curb uranium enrichment above 5%. It also gave the UN inspectors better access in return for about $7 billion in sanctions relief at talks with the group in Geneva. Pope Francis, he took the name of a humble saint and then called for a church of healing. The first non-European Pope in 1200 years is poised to transform a place that measures change by the century. Here's a closer look at what makes Pope Francis the most intriguing personality of the year 2013. White smoke rose from the Sistine Chapel on the 13th of March 2013. The bells of St. Peter's rang out. Signaling cardinals had elected a new pope to succeed Benedict and take charge of the troubled Roman Catholic Church. Hundreds of thousands greeted the newly elected Pope Francis with tears of joy. Fratelli e sorelle, buonasera. Buonasera. 
Pues a Peter, que il dovere del conclave era di dare un vescovo a Roma. Sembra che i miei fratelli cardinali sono andati a prenderlo quasi alla fine del mondo, ma siamo qui. Within months, one thing was clear, that Pope Francis was not just a leader with an extraordinary vision, but might also be the Pope of the century. From showering blessings one day to appearing on the cover of a gay rights magazine, meeting world leaders, talking politics and sports, to launching sharp attacks on mega salaries and big bonuses, the Pope has many shades. Perhaps this made Pope Francis Time magazine's final choice for Person of the Year. This is the third time the magazine has chosen a Pope as its Person of the Year. Time gave that honour to Pope John Paul II in 1994 and to Pope John XXIII in 1963. Time magazine's Person of the Year for 2013 is Pope Francis. We think that in the, in the nine months that he has been Pope, he has been a transformational figure. He has changed perceptions of the Church, he has changed the focus of the Church, he has changed the tone of the Church. It was seen as being very doctrinal and, and very focused on, on matters of dogma. Now it, he has made it about service, about serving the poor. Uh, and all this in just nine months, and that is quite remarkable. After decades of precipitous decline, Polls find church attendance spiking in Italy, Spain and Britain. La professionalità che significa competenza, studio, aggiornamento. Questo è un requisito fondamentale per lavorare nella curia. Naturalmente la professionalità si forma e in parte anche si acquisisce. Ma penso che proprio perché si formi e perché venga a Chista, bisogna che ci sia dall'inizio. Thou shall not has been replaced by a church that seeks not to judge but to love, and Catholics are loving it. La humildad, la colaboración con los, los más necesitados, con los pobres, con el, el dar una mano al prójimo, creo que sí, que, que está muy bien el premio que le dieron, creo que sí, que todos se acercan un poco más a la iglesia, porque él da muchas pruebas de humildad. Since taking charge, Francis has also shifted the tone of the church towards a focus on service, compassion and helping the poor and addressed controversial issues such as homosexuality and the role of women in the church. The 84-page document known as the Apostolic Exhortation highlighted many of the economic and social justice issues of today's world and prompted reactions from critics worldwide. Called Evangelii Gaudium, the exhortation is presented in Francis's simple and warm preaching style, distinct from the more academic writings of former popes and stresses the Church's central mission of preaching, the beauty of the saving love of God made manifest in Jesus Christ. The Pope is giving the Church new life, whether speaking on the role of women, life and family issues, the common good or being a church for the poor. Pope Francis is challenging people to think outside the box and travel to the fringes because for the Pope, the Church is missionary or she will die. Time for a short break. The special edition continues. The sporting arena was full of surprises. Champions were dethroned, icons decided to rest for good, and the world saw fresh talent emerge to take the world head on with sheer charisma. Here's a closer look at the biggest sporting events and personalities of 2013. Rafael Nadal capped a remarkable return to the game after missing seven months through injury to reclaim the world number one ranking from Novak Djokovic. Nadal, who boosted his Grand Slam singles tally to 13 this year by winning the French and US Opens, had not been ranked number one since July 2011, but produced a stunning run after returning from a long injury layoff in February. The Spaniard won 10 tournaments and came runner-up in four others, adding over $12 million in prize money during the year. In the women's game, Serena Williams clinched the year-end women's world number one ranking for the third time in her career after winning two Grand Slam titles 
During an excellent year, the American won 11 single titles on the WTA Tour including the French Open and the US Open crowns and the WTA Championship in Istanbul, in the process becoming the first woman to win more money than the top men's player in a single year. Germany's Sebastian Vettel roared into the record books as Formula 1's youngest four-time world champion. My life between 22 yards for 24 years, it's hard to believe that that wonderful journey is coming to an end. Sachin Tendulkar bid an emotional farewell to the sport at his home Wankhede Stadium against the West Indies, signing off as cricketer's most prolific run scorer after a sparkling career that spanned almost a quarter of a century. Bayern Munich gave departing manager Jupe Heynckes the perfect present, leaving all challengers in their way as they sealed a treble of Champion League, Bundesliga title and German Cup. The English Premier League was won by Manchester United where Alex Ferguson, Britain's longest serving and most successful football manager, retired at the end of the season after more than 26 years spent decorating the old Trafford Trophy room with silverware. David Beckham was another British icon heading into retirement, the former England captain going out in style helping Ancelotti's Paris Saint-Germain win the French title for the first time since 1994. Brazil won the Confederation Cup beating Spain 3-0 at the Maracana in Rio de Janeiro in a tournament where the action on the pitch was overshadowed by protests off of it. Tiger Woods returned to the number one ranking in March. The 37-year-old won five tournaments in the year but was not able to add to his 14 major titles, the last of which he won in 2008. Two bombs ripped through the crowd at the finish line of the Boston Marathon in April. Many runners were heading for the finish when a fireball and smoke rose from behind, cheering spectators and a row of flags separating the countries of participants. Toppling Usain Bolt from his sprint throne could take a while yet with the untouchable Jamaican star off track and feel still looking down on those who seek to challenge his reign. Bolt duly completed a 100m, 200m and 4 into 100m relay treble to match his feats of the last two Olympics to become the most successful athlete in World Championship history and left promising his goal was more games glory in Rio in 2016. Japan won the race to host the 2020 Olympic Games, anticipating an economic boost to spur its revival from two decades of stagnation and help it recover from the devastating 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Germany's Thomas Bach was elected president of the International Olympic Committee, succeeding Belgian Jacques Rogue and maintaining a European stranglehold on the most powerful position in the world sport. The story wouldn't be complete if we don't tell you all about how the year turned out to be for the world of showbiz. From the royal birth of Prince George to the Michael Jackson civil trial, 2013 was a hotbed of milestones, scandals and celebrations. It was a mixed year with some really big movies doing extremely well at the box office. While it was the year of soaring highs for some, others found it rather tough to reign on the top. Here's the showbiz roundup. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, William and Kate, celebrated the birth of their baby boy on July 22nd. Named George Alexander Lewis, the baby is the third in line to the British throne. The proud parents debuted the new prince shortly after his birth on the steps of the hospital. Angelina Jolie had a double mastectomy. In May, the Oscar-winning actress wrote an editorial in the New York Times saying that she had the procedure as a preventative measure to reduce her chances of getting breast cancer. She said she hoped her story would inspire other women fighting the life-threatening disease. The family of late singer Michael Jackson sued concert promoter AEG but lost the case after a sensational five-month trial that offered a glimpse into the private life and final days of the King of Pop. Breaking Bad ended its five-season run on a high note in 2013. The show took home the top honour at the Primetime Emmy Awards, winning the Best Drama Series Prize for the first time. 
Also at the Emmys, Claire Danes clinched her second consecutive Best Drama Actress Emmy for her role as a bipolar CIA agent in Homeland. Female strength was also evident in earnings for music stars with pop singer Madonna named as the highest paid woman in music by Forbes taking in $125 million in 2013 from her MDNA tour. Lady Gaga came in close at number 2nd with $80 million followed by Taylor Swift at $55 million. One Direction continued their meteoric rise with the release of their hugely successful concert documentary film One Direction This Is Us. The former X Factor contestants released their latest album Midnight Memories in November and are going on tour in spring of 2014. On the movie side of showbiz, the year belonged to Jennifer Lawrence who was crowned with the Best Actress Oscar in February for her role as a grieving young widow in Silver Linings Playbook. Other big winners at the box office included Iron Man 3 with a worldwide gross of $1.2 billion, Despicable Me with a worldwide gross of $900 million and Superman flick Man of Steel which grossed $700 million. Argo, about the Iranian hostage crisis and directed by Ben Affleck, won the Best Picture Prize at the Academy Awards but Affleck was snubbed by not getting a nomination in the directing category despite winning the top prize at the Directors Guild Awards, a general indicator of the Best Director Oscar winner which was won this year by Ang Lee who helmed Life of Pi. Daniel Day-Lewis made history by becoming the first to win three Best Actor Oscars this time for his role as US President Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln. Anne Hathaway won the prize for supporting actress for Les Miserables and Christoph Waltz won a second Best Supporting Actor Oscar for Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained. British singer Adele also took home gold that night for co-writing the winning song for the James Bond film Skyfall. And with that, we come to the end of this episode. We look forward to continuing this journey with you next week. Do send in your feedback on Facebook and Twitter as well. As we wrap up, here's wishing you all a very happy new year from our team here at the studios. Goodbye.